Let's say, well, thank you very much to the Congress Organizing Committee for this opportunity to present our objects from the British Museum collection. The British Museum is a museum dedicated to human history and culture. Its collections come from all over the world, including from Central Asia. To find out what objects are specifically from Uzbekistan in the collection, we can search on the museum's online database, which is available on its website. All objects in registration number can have a record on this database, although the content of the entries are not really being updated and So a search by the place, a key term of Uzbekistan on the database, comes up with 1,795 results. Next, please. To put this into perspective, a search for other Central Asian Republics gives the following results. The largest number of objects are from Turkmenistan, and the majority of these are small archaeological fragments. Objects from Uzbekistan form the second largest group, and they include different types of artifacts from the early centuries AD all the way to the contemporary period. In this talk, I would like to introduce some objects related to Uzbekistan and the collection according to the categories noted in the title of this talk coins, banknotes, images, and vessels. This is not a comprehensive list. There are things such as um, the ethnographic collection with accessories and textiles and so on, which I will not talk about today, but you can find this on our collections online. Next, please. The largest category of objects from Uzbekistan in the British Museum is currency, that is, coins and banknotes that are kept in the coins and letters department. There are over a thousand items in this category, most of which are coins. And here are some examples of coins minted in the character of Uzbekistan in the collection. On the left is a silver coin that was minted in Kara, an imitation of silver coins from Europe in Turkmenistan, with the image of the Sasanian king, Hurang V, who ruled during the early 5th century. It shows the influence of the Sasanian Empire in this region. On the right is a silver coin or euro um, that is minted in Samarkand in 923 AD during the Samanid dynasty. In the 9th and 10th centuries, dirhams were used as coinage across the Islamic world. They were also used in trade exchange with the peoples of Scandinavia, commonly known as the Vikings. Many examples of dirhams have been found in ports in northern Europe. Some made their way even further west to Britain. This coin, together with 14 other Samanid coins, was found in the Bell of York Court, which was buried in North Yorkshire, England, in about 1978. Next, please. They were found inside a gilt silver vessel, together with other items. They would have been traded from Central Asia, up the rivers, into Russia, through Scandinavia, and finally reaching Britain. It is an example of the vibrant international networks that already existed during the early Middle Ages and the connection between Britain and Uzbekistan. Next, please. The museum also collects modern currency, such as this coin that was produced in 2002 in commemoration of the 2700th anniversary of Shamsar um, in southern Uzbekistan. Next, please. And there are also some modern banknotes in the collection, such as these, um, that were issued uh, in 1918, one from Bukhara and the other from Tashkent. Coins and banknotes reflect important economic and political changes. Moreover, their designs are full of symbolic meaning. Next, please. This was the topic of some recent research by my colleague Dr. Han Wang, curator of the Asian Money who has published widely on money along the Silk Road. She has co-written an article with Victoria's Fluka titled Silk Road Textiles on Banknotes of the Central Asian Republics, soon to be published in the journal Asian Textiles. This article points out that after becoming independent, Central Asian Republics used textiles in the designs of banknotes to highlight associations with the Silk Road as part of national identity. So this article includes a discussion of this banknote from Uzbekistan, issued in 2021, um, that clearly shows the pattern of ikat, the famous textiles produced in this region, as a symbol of Uzbek identity. In addition to coins and banknotes, the coins and 
Arts Department at the British Museum also collects other forms of material culture related to money. Next, please. An interesting recent acquisition is the bilingual Uzbek Russian poster from 1942 by the Tashkent based artist Mikhail In the center of this poster is a 500 ruble war loan, and to the right is a Uzbek woman dressed in ink clothing signing the subscription document. So this poster uh, was aimed at raising funds to help the Soviet war efforts during the Second World War. Next, please. Another interesting recent acquisition made by my colleague Dr. Tom Uppenhall is a group of vignettes from 1991 featuring various Uzbek and Kazakh historic sites that were made for banknotes. These vignettes were produced by the British company Harrison and Sons a major engraver and printer of postage stamps and banknotes. The first Uzbekistan song and Kazakhstan Tange banknotes were actually made in the UK by this company. So these are the trial designs for the banknotes. For example, this one shows a view I believe, of the Shai Zinka metropolis here in Samarkand. So another quite interesting connection between Uzbekistan and Britain. So this is a very quick introduction to some objects related to Uzbekistan in the points and manners department at the British Museum. Other Central Asian objects in the collection are looked after by other departments, including Asia and the Middle East departments. Next, please. For the remainder of the talk, I would like to focus on two notable historical vessels in the collection. The first is the famous Fiddling Factory J Cup of the Tamaric Dynasty while the other is a silver bowl made in pre-Islamic Khwarazmia that today comes under the territories of Uzbekistan and Turkmenistan. This jade cup, carved from that is also known as the Ulubek cup, as it carries an inscription at the rim written in Arabic that reads Ulubek Kurgan in this case. Uh, in here in Zahakan, Ulubek is such an introduction, and we've already heard about him as well in the earlier talk. Um, the term here, Kurgan, uh, as scholars have explained, uh, refers to son-in-law, referring to what looks like family connections by marriage to Indus Khan and the Mongol Empire. Next, please. A later repair in silver on the cup carries a, a Turkish inscription that praises God's generosity. This repair probably dates to the 17th or 18th century when it seems that this object was brought to the Ottoman Empire. Uh, and this cup was purchased by the British Museum in 1959. Jade is considered a special and magical material in both China and Islamic lands. A key source for jade was the rivers of Khotan, the present day Xinjiang, China. A single little handle of the cup has been said to uh, mostly derive from a nomadic tradition where horse riders who like comes to their belts. And this cup has a distinct handle in the shape of a sheep or Chinese owner's dragon. It's a fighting the rim and its four limbs are spread over the side of the cup. Next, please. This mythical creature was depicted in a variety of forms on objects from China since ancient times, including on jade, such as this sword slide in the Paris Museum Beijing, dating to the War of States period. Next, please. The oval shape of this cup and low wood is also quite interesting and seems to bear some resemblance to wine cups known as Yushan in China that were made with a variety of materials, including jade, but clearly the handle is different. As scholars have mentioned and discussed, the design of the Ulufek cup raises questions about whether it was cut in China or in Central Asia based on the Chinese model. It is possible that the cup was made um, in the main dynasty imperial workshop in Beijing, China, and brought to Samarkand as a diplomatic gift. Diplomatic exchanges took place between the Timurid and Ming dynasties during the 15th century, including in 1445 when the Ming court sent gifts to Ulu Beg that included jade objects. However, the scholars now seem to think that it's more probable that the jade cup was made in Central Asia possibly even by Chinese craftsmen, since the carving of jade at the imperial court in China tend to be more delicate and with greater detail. Next, please. Next, please. 
um, such as on the face of the Qi dragon, based on tradition of white and jade that had already gone on for thousands of years by this point. Also, dark green jade objects were quite rare from the main court. Most surviving objects from the period tend to be made of a pale green jade. Next, please. But what is certain is that Lutfeld was interested in jade objects. Apart from the jade cup in the British Museum, this white jade pamphlet in Lisbon, Portugal, also has the ruler's name and titles carved along its neck. It has further inscriptions with, uh, from the rulers of the Mughal Empire recording the later prominence of the object. It's believed that this jug was most of a pamphlet was most likely made in Samarkand, which would indicate the jade carving skill available for the back and his taste for jade objects. Next, please. This jade cup was included in the British Museum's History of the World in a 100 Objects series and in the British Museum's special exhibition named 50 Years That Changed China. Next, please. Next, yes. Um, in 2014, to highlight the connections between early in China and the Timurid dynasty. Next, please. It's currently on display in the Islamic World Gallery, which is sponsored by the Al-Bukhari Foundation from Malaysia. I was involved in the main 50 years that changed China exhibition as a project curator. So the Ulu Bag Cup can be considered my first professional introduction to the arts of Central Asia. In the final part of this talk, I would like to introduce an object in the British Museum collection that is relevant to my current project, a Silk Rose exhibition at the British Museum that is planned for September 2024. Next, please. The object is this silver bowl from Krasnia. It was purchased by the museum in 1877 from a Russian princess. At the center of the bowl is a four-armed goddess seated on a lion. Next, please. It has a Krasnian inscription on its exterior rim, and this bowl is one of the small number of surviving metal vessels that carry Krasnian inscriptions. Most of them are in Russian collections. Krasnian is a derivation of the Aramaic written tradition and has not been fully deciphered. And scholars have managed to identify a date from the inscription on this bowl, which is the year 700 of the Krasnian era, which um, recently is found to re refer to the mid 8th century. Next, please. Similar depictions of the four armed goddess can be found on several other silver bowls from Krasnia, clearly indicating that this goddess was worshipped in the region. Next, please. Her appearance resembles the representation of the goddess Nana or Nanea, venerated by the Sophians as the patron goddess of the city of Frankie Kent. The four-armed goddess rides a lion and holds the sun and moon in the upper pair of hands. Next, please. More recently, further identification of the words in the inscription of the Vian Silver Bowl reveals Gloria's Nanea as the recipient of the vessel, and this most likely refers to the goddess depicted on it, and indicates that the bowl functioned as a bowl to offering to the deity. So Karasimia was one of many cities that were once part of the networks of the ancient silk roads. The surviving material culture of Karasimia, like the silver bowl, shows cross-cultural developments that are a result of exchanges along the silk roads. The cult of Nana, uh, Banana itself is synthetic in nature. Um, and uh, the depiction of her and goddesses, or goddesses like her can be found across the wide territory before the Muslim conquest. Um, the metal work of Khorasmia uh, shows similarities to Sasanian and Soviet metal work, but also has local characteristics. Next, please. Such topics of transcultural interactions are precisely those that we would like to consider and highlight in the forthcoming Silk Road exhibition which will examine the connections across Afro-Eurasia in the period 500 to 2000 AD. My colleagues and I, working on this project at the PM, hope to include artifacts from Central Asia, especially Uzbekistan, in the exhibition. And I look forward very much to learning more about the rich culture and history of this country during my visit. Thank you very much. <laughs>